Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father God, we praise your holy name for you are good, faithful, and true. You never leave us nor forsake us. You are so good, and we just praise you. We give you praise for you're the creator. We give you praise because you're holy. We give you praise because you're God. I pray that you would, uh, worship would be in our heart, the gospel in our lips, and the spirit in our minds. Guide us and direct us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. On June 6, 1944, is known as uh, the Normandy Invasion of France, or D-Day. The German war machine under Hitler's command had taken over most of Europe, and Hitler's genocide continued as brutal massacre and his insatiable appetite for death had only pushed him for more violence. Having attacked and taken Poland in 1939, World War II began. In 1942, Hitler attacked the Soviet Union, and he was fighting a two-front war. Finally, in 1944, under the leadership of General Eisenhower, an attack on the German stronghold was planned. A foothold had to be gained in Europe. Hitler had to be stopped. On June 6, the Allied forces, with a, which consisted of the U.S., Britain, France, Australia, Belgium, Brazil, Canada, Denmark, Greece, Netherlands, Poland, and Norway, Norway stormed the beaches of Normandy, France. A great movie I always liked was The Longest Day. But that's not one of my sermons, The Longest Day, but it's a good movie. Well, uh, on four German divisions and one panzer division awaited them. 150,000 soldiers stretched over 50 miles of uh, beaches when the attack began. There were over 100,000 casualties, or t excuse me, 10,000 casualties. Before the men began to storm the beaches, Eisenhower spoke to the uh, Allied forces, and this is what he said. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force. You're about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of the liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. You will bring about the destruction of the German war machine, the elimination of Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe, and security for ourselves in a free world. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, and battle-hardened. He will fight savagely. The tide has turned. The free men of the world are marching together to victory. I have full confidence in your courage, devotion to duty, and skill in battle. We will accept nothing less than full victory. When I think of D-Day, the day that the Allied forces gained a foothold in Europe and the Nazi war machine was no longer attacking but defending, I see the Allied forces had already won. The Nazi war machine was on its heels. They had lost. They just didn't know it. The end of the war was in sight, and in less than a year, the Nazi general, Alfred Jodl, would sign the unconditional surrender. The terror and horror that the Nazi agenda realized demonstrated how truly barbaric humanity can be. It demonstrated our human nature in all of its ugliness. Yet they were losing and lost when D-Day happened. Similarly, the enemy, Satan, the devils of this evil age have lost when Jesus died and rose again. We face an enemy. We face his weapons. We face his oppressive agenda. We face his deceptive attacks. We see his flaming arrows and the lies that he so readily speaks. Yet he is defeated. He is defeated. And when we live in this evil age, we too can accept nothing less than full victory. We too can say the free men of the world are marching together in victory. We can expect that our task will not be easy, that our enemy is well-trained and well-equipped and battle-hardened, and he will fight savagely, savagely. But together in Christ, in the beauty of his truth, truth, we will bring about the destruction and the end of the devil and his oppressive schemes because he's already defeated. We in Christ will bring about the end of his tyranny because Christ has risen from the dead. But only when we serve together, pray together, worship together, build each other up together, and heal each other together do we see and experience the victory. As you go into battle, I challenge you today, cling to Christ. In Ephesians 6, we're called to battle, so we better gear up. We better get ready. When Paul said in Ephesians 5.18, be filled with the Spirit, he was telling us to rely on God for his strength and his victory. We don't look to our strength. We don't look to our, uh, ourselves. We look to him. It's his strength. 
When you're spirit-filled, you're empowered by the Spirit to live in the power of the Spirit. When you're spirit-filled, you're driven to relationship, relationship to God and to each other. After Paul said, be filled with the Spirit, he then talked about how we're to live in relationship with each other, in marriage, in family, with slave and master. Then he turns and he says, as you face the battle every day, you are to be spirit-filled. The New Testament calls us to have a spirit-filled life, a spirit-filled church, and a spirit-filled relationships. In the power of the Holy Spirit, we cling to Christ. So number one, stand firm on Christ. Let's take a look at verses uh, 13 and 14 of Ephesians 6. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in evil, in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. In 6.13, we are told, there are two words for stand. The, stand. the first one is antithesis, which is opposite. Uh, we stand opposed. We're called to put on the whole armor of God so we can stand opposed to whatever the enemy and his agenda and what he wants to accomplish. We stand opposed to the enemy. The second word in the last part of verse 13 is simply the word to stand. As we stand in Christ and on Christ, we are defeating the enemy. We're defeating the enemy because he's already defeated. We have to remember who our enemy is. It's not each other. We are not the enemy. We can act like the enemy to each other. The enemy wants to use us to cause conflict and to hurt each other. But the enemy is the devil. And he loves to put that conflict amongst us and to have us fight each other. And then he stands back and laughs at us as we hurt each other. In this verse, we're commanded to take up the whole armor of God. This is the same word to take up. This is the same word used in Acts 1.11. When Jesus was taken up to heaven. It is a word that means you just do it. You take up the armor of God. We take up the armor of God because it's a sure thing. It is a guarantee we will overcome the enemy. It's a sure thing, a certainty. Christ did overcome. He did defeat the devil's work. 1 John 3, 8. We're told to put on the whole armor of God so that we can withstand or stand against the evil day. We can be prepared for the evil day. We're told in 6.13 that this day of evil is coming and has come. And we stand ready to unleash God's love and His presence and His grace. The enemy causes a wave of lies. We're told in 6.13 that that day of evil is coming. The enemy has all this lies coming our way. An onslaught of subtle lies, a barrage, a blitzkrieg of hate, bad events, discouragements. He fills our heart and minds with what we go through and our circumstances that we, we undergo. We have deep hurts from past things. We have painful situations, cutting words from other people. We have failures. And all these are used by the enemy to doubt God's word. Don't believe it, he says. Don't believe his word. That's He uses all these things that come our way around us. And say, don't believe God's word. See, because of all these things that have happened to you. And boy, he wants that doubt to fill your heart and mind. But we are called to stand firm. Be ready, gear up, knowing that the day of evil is coming. But he's defeated because Christ is risen from the dead. We slice through the lies. We stand on the truth of Christ and his finished work. We know that the cross of Christ has defeated our sin, has forgiven our sins, and the, uh, the empty grave is proof that death is defeated. We put on the armor of God because we know and we know we believe with the firmest of convictions. We're immovable that Christ is Lord. To put on the armor means battle is happening. It also means we're able to stand against the enemy and his schemes when we put on the armor. If we do not put on the armor of God, then we will fall prey to the lies, the subtlety of lies. We will fall prey to doubt, death, disease, and hell. So we cling to Christ. Number one, prepare for the battle. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm, let nothing move you. Always giving yourselves fully. To the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Let nothing move you, always giving yourselves fully 
to the work of the Lord. We are to stand firm. And you know why he writes this verse? This is the very last verse of chapter 15 when he talks about the resurrection. This is why we can stand firm, because Christ has risen. That's the whole point he's trying to make, stand firm. <laughs> you know, this word for stand firm means steadfast. We're steadfast. We have made up our mind. The matter is resolved. It is firm. It's solid. It cannot be stopped. The, we, we will be firm, unswayed, undeterred, immovable, fixed, ready, established, and geared up for battle. To put on the armor of God means that we know the battle is happening, and we are prepared for it. We are convinced fully and completely of who Christ is and what He has accomplished. There exists no doubt. There is an attitude of complete faithfulness. That is what it means to stand firm. Has God said yes? As God said, because he has said, we stand firm. The world in all of its academic pursuits and all of its scientific brilliance and amazing discoveries has been used to produce doubt, not faith. The human condition is bent on not exalting God, but doubting him. We exalt him. Number two, the truth holds the armor in place. The soldier would tighten his belt, showing he was ready for combat. In the process of tightening the belt, he drew up his tunic and cinched it so it would not impede him in battle. For the soldier, the belt held everything in place. The tightening of the belt meant the sword was firmly in place. Without the belt, he was powerless in battle. And so are we. Without truth, we are powerless in battle. If there is doubt, if there is a question, we will not cinch up our belt. We will not put on our game faces. We will not step out ready for war without cinching ourselves tightly with the truth of Scripture. The other weapons and armor simply will not work. When you are so filled with the truth of Christ, you will stand firm, so cinch up your belt. The belt is truth. In Psalm 56, David cried out to God because the Philistines had seized him. He wrote, when I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I will not be afraid. What can mortal man do to me? Someone who's so wrapped up in the truth of Christ that no man can cause him to fear. No event can take away his faith. No person can remove his love for who God is. When you think of Christ, he would not bend and he was not to be swayed or coerced. When his body screamed for food, he would not obey its desires. Only when the Father told him to eat. He obeyed the Father. He would not turn water into wine in the manner his, father, his mother wanted him, but instead in the manner his father wanted him. He was not coerced to go up to Jerusalem as his brothers demanded, but quietly as his father wanted. He stood firm under the forceful demands of the Pharisees and the attacks of the Sadducees. He did not give in to the whims of the crowds, and he did not lose sight of the cross even when he prayed in the garden. He did not let the burden of the cross prevent him from following that pa beaten path. That path, excuse me. He was, he was mocked. He was hated. He still did not deter. He still was not coerced away. He still followed the, the way to the cross. He was firmly established. He stood firm. Should we not do the same for him? When you are so convinced of Christ, you will cling to Christ because you have won in Christ. To live in truth means we have to know how the enemy lies and whatever lies you have believed. Root out the work of the enemy today. Whatever lies he's told you, root them out. Get rid of them. These are not true. When you have cinched up your belt, then you put on the breastplate of righteousness. This was an armor that covered the neck and your chest, belly, and back. It's kind of like what the police use in Kevlar. Uh, today, the vital organs are protected from random jabs with a sword or a wayward arrow shot from a distance. We must put on the breastplate of righteousness. This does not come from us, but given to us by Christ. Righteousness does not come from us. It comes from Christ. It has to be given to us. I am made righteous through Christ and Christ alone. And so we receive his righteousness. When God sees righteousness on you, he sees his son. And let me tell you, when he called, what did he say about Christ? This is my son in whom I am well pleased. He did not say that about me. He didn't look at me and say, well, I'm well pleased with Mark. No, he said, Christ. So if Christ is in me, then I am well pleasing to the Father. 
And so this was important that we put the breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness that covers you, protects you from the wrath of God. The righteousness of God placed over you, protects the enemy, hitting the vital spots of your faith. The righteousness of God identifies me as belonging to God. I belong to God. You belong to God. His identity is now seen in me. When you think of the first two articles of armor, it's truth and righteousness. What is the difference between the two? Well, there's really not any. Is not Christ our truth and righteousness? What is righteousness but truth lived out? Overwhelmingly revealed in me through his love. Righteousness is his love revealed in me. I'm righteous because of Christ my Lord. If I put on my righteousness, oh man, I am easily defeated. Boy, that won't stop any of Satan's arrows. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> Many a time the enemy, though, will say to you, he'll lie to you, you know what he'll say to you? Do you really think you're that good? Do you think you're righteous? Do you really think God loves you? Do you think that God cares about you? Pff, he doesn't care. You, you're so far gone. You have so much work to do. That's a lie. He loves you deeply and desires to give you his righteousness. I am righteous because of Christ Jesus, my Lord. The sword of the enemy cannot penetrate the strength of Christ, my Lord. He cannot overcome my identity. I am righteous, so I will live righteously all because of Christ, and I will cling to Christ. Number two, stand firm and push the enemy back. Let's look at verses 15 and 16. And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. The wicked one. I got that one good. The wicked one. Tie up your shoes, cinch up your belt, gear up. This is what we're called to live. The boots the soldiers wore was like a half boot. It was an open-toed leather boot with a heavily nail-studded sole. So I have these nails in it on the bottom part which was tied to the ankle, the, the, the boot or the, this boot was tied to the ankles, and then you had these shins that, or these shin straps that protected your shins. They were kind of like cleats, if you will, uh, when you play football. These boots gave you traction, uh, which prevented sliding. The shoes demonstrated that the enemy, because of the traction, could not push you back. You could stand firm against his attacks. You stood on the, you, we, because of Christ, stand on his finished work. Number one, ready your feet. As we look at these verses, it's apparent that we are not to fight the enemy alone. We are together are to stand firm. We together are to tighten the belt, put on the breastplate of righteousness, and tie our shoes. In your families, you're to create homes where Christ is truly worshipped, where we are fully convinced of the truth of Christ, where doubt is understood and defeated by the Word of God, where we are ready for the day of evil to come, the lies, the bad situations, knowing our God is there walking with us, not forsaking us, not leaving us. Husbands, love your wives in the truth of Christ, showing your children the truth of God's word. God's word overrides any philosophy and any ideology. We hold firmly to the truth of his word. In the 60s, they may have taken prayer out of the schools, but don't let them take prayer out of your home. Pray. Destroy the work of the devil through prayer. The world may scorn the gospel, laugh at the Bible, Endorse immorality, but in your home, uphold the word, teach the truth, live in Christ. Let, let us doubt the world and uphold the truth of Christ. As a church, we know the Bible has faced centuries of attack. The Bible is viewed as a human creation where scholars claim the words of Christ are fabricated. We teach the truth, though. We stand firmly on the solid ground of the Bible knowing it is God's word. We do not waver. We're not caught up in the lies of the age. We are not swept up and blown here and there by other ideas. We do not get caught up by the culture and the lies of culture and the fads of culture and the lifestyles of culture. We stand on the, on the word of God. We're not, we are like a tree firmly planted. The winds may be strong, but they will not uproot us. We stand our ground and we oppose the enemy. We do this because we cling to Christ. And we say to the world, let me show you a more excellent way. The foundation of peace is love. The armor of God requires we put on the shoes. 
and the shoes are the gospel of peace. It's the word of God. It's the hope of the world. It's Jesus Christ having died and risen again. The gospel of peace takes us out and says, let me show you who Christ is, his love for you, his grace for you. He can forgive you of your sins. You're destined for hell. You will die and go to hell if you do not confess and repent. And God has made a home for you to live so that you can live with him. Repent, confess, call on Christ to save you from your sins. And he will save you. He will justify you. He'll call you righteous. He will call you his own. He doesn't want you to go to hell. He wants you to be with him. So cling to Christ. Number two, faith is revealing truth. And this next article of armor is the shield of faith. Now, the shield of the Roman soldiers used was large. It was a four feet high and two and a half feet wide. So it was a pretty decent size. It was like a door. In fact, the word door in Greek is derived from the word shield. It was made of two layers of laminated wood, covered with, first with linen and then with animal hide, and then bound top and bottom with iron, with an iron ornament decorating the front of it. And so a soldier could literally put his entire body behind a shield, absorbing the javelins and arrows of the army. And the th leather that covered it, you know, if there was a fiery arrow or dart or whatever, it would extinguish it it was prepared for that. And so this, this, this shield was able to snuff out the flaming arrows as it buried itself in the thickness of the shield. As I look at the shield, it's called what? Faith. We hide behind our faith, behind Christ. Faith in God is our protection of the flaming arrows of the enemy. The arrows can't touch us. It is faith that is a key to knowing how to stand. You see, Paul told us to stand, to be fixed, immovable, to be resolved and convicted of the truth. The enemy cannot move us. We can advance against the enemy because the shield of faith protects us from his assaults. The integrity of our faith and the authenticity of our relationship move us forward, and we push the enemy back. If there is doubt, you know what happens when you have doubt? You lower the shield. And when you lower the shield, what happens? Well, here comes an arrow. And it hits us. It burns us. It wounds us. And as you're wounded, you then drop the shield. And in pain, opening it up to more and more arrows. If you see someone down, filled with arrows, pick up their shield. Let us not suffer alone, but fight together and for each other. And let us cling to Christ together. You know, the foundation of faith is truth and Christ. I firmly believe, we firmly believe Jesus Christ is Lord. The Bible is God's word. God's love is secure. The enemy wants you to doubt because once you doubt, you'll lower your shield. In Isaiah 7, the prophet said, if you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. In Psalm 11, when the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? If the foundations are destroyed, there's nothing left to stand on. Where will you go if the foundation is gone? What will you do? Where will you stand? You know, every time you look at the Internet, you turn on TV, you drive down the road, you read the news, open a book, listen to the radio, talk to another person, the enemy is using whatever he can to infiltrate and put doubt in your mind an addictive lifestyle, or shift your focus onto you. That doesn't mean you don't do any of the things. You don't turn on the computer, drive down the road, talk to other people, listen to TV, whatever. You just be aware of what he's up to. You be aware of his schemes. You're aware of how he's fighting. That Anything I do, everything I'm looking at, everything I'm walking today, the enemy is going to use something to attack me. So I'm aware of his schemes, and I'm ready with my shield. And so I will not put the focus on me. I will not think about, oh, woe is me. I will think of how I can serve and bless and love others. You know, when you are firm in your faith, convinced without equivocation of your God, his word and his love for you, you will not let up and you will push the enemy back. So let us cling to Christ. Number three, stand firm on the word. Let's look at 17 and 18. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. 
It's interesting that salvation is the helmet. Our minds are where the greatest battle exists. It is where the lies of the enemy can live rent free. There may be things in your past where someone has said something to you, and it's still there. And you remember those words as if they said it yesterday. You remember. And then you start to say and get angry. And you start to get mad. And then you make a vow. I'll never let anyone do that to me again. And then every time you hear that, you're like, just a little beacon. You hear that word. Ah! And you're allowing this false message to dictate your life. It's a lie. His word is truth. Don't let the lies of the enemy live rent free in your head. That's where addictions come from. That's where hurts are. We try to medicate our hurts and we're powerless to sin. You know, the mind is the seed of imagination. It's a reason that Paul wrote, we take every thought captive in Christ. We take every thought captive because it doesn't belong if it's not of his word. So number one, protect your mind. The helmet is salvation because it's where we gain our new identity. The helmet in the ancient world had a band to protect the forehead and plates for the cheeks and extended down back to protect the neck. When the helmet was strapped in place, it it exposed very little besides your eyes and your nose and mouth. And the metal helmets, due to their weight, had a nice little velvet inside to make it feel comfortable. Virtually the only weapon which could penetrate the the helmet would be uh, like a hammer or an axe. And the helmet of salvation is the confidence, certainty, and resolution, firm and steadfastness we have in Christ. It is a calm demeanor. It is knowing I have won and defeated the enemy in Christ. What can the enemy do to me since salvation is certain? I am truly justified. I am called righteous by God. Putting the helmet of salvation means no turning back. It means battle ready. There is seriousness to your resolve and your attitude. The lies of the enemy cannot reach your mind. In fact, you can see lies coming a mile away. (laughs) Here comes an arrow. I'm ready. (laughs) the lies of the enemy cannot reach you the addictions cannot overcome you the selfishness withers away the presence of Christ overwhelms your soul and you're compelled to worship great are you Lord when thinking of your mind you have to realize that Christ is Lord your mind is to be captured by Christ set free by Christ overcome by Christ typically our minds are bent on sin and our imaginations can take us to dark places What we do and what we think is revealed in how we live. In Proverbs, it says, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. How you think is how you live. That is why I must renew my mind. I must dedicate my mind to God. I must let the transforming power of the Holy Spirit empower my mind. I want my mind to be the same as Christ Jesus, so I will cling to him. Number two, attack the enemy. The next article is the sword. All the articles of the armor have been defensive, um, and this one's offensive. This one attacks. The other articles safeguard you from the attacks. The sword is the weapon that Satan cannot defeat. Lies cannot overcome this weapon. Hatred melts away. Death dies, and diseases are healed. The word for the sword is in this verse is makaria or something like that, not the other thing. Which is the, it was just a double short sword. It was a smaller sword than like those long ones that you see. And it was used for hand-to-hand combat. It was a double-edged meaning it was lethal. And it was usually, again, close to close combat. When Jesus faced the temper and tempter in the desert, he used this sword, uh, the, the word of God, three times and defeated the enemy three times. It helps us to overcome temptations. In Hebrew 4.12, 4, we read this, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrows. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. It judges the thoughts and attitudes. That's, that's pretty <laughs> clear. Lord, open my mind. Show me. <laughs> Get rid of all that stuff that don't belong. The Word of God makes us uncomfortable because it judges our thoughts and attitudes. It defeats the enemy because he's a liar and the Word is truth. 
It gives us life because it was the Word of God that created the world. When Jesus Christ returns in Revelation, it is said of Christ, out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. The sword is the Word of God. For no nation, no evil can stand in the power of God's word. This is why the word of God is so considered controversial. Because it's his word. And sin does not like his word. But we cherish his word. The word of God reveals the heart and mind of God. The word of God reveals his will. The word of God describes and defines love. The word of God shows reality. The word of God is life. God created the heavens and the earth by his word. The word of God renews our mind, opens our eyes, shows us freedom, rescues us from the traps of the evil one. Do not doubt his word, but instead live in truth of his word and cling to his word. I pray, and when I pray in the morning with my wife, I say, Lord, I believe every word that in your word. I know doubt comes in my mind. There's things that I, I want to, I'm tempted to doubt. Lord, I don't want to doubt it. But believe every, every word. Number three, never stop praying. As I read this verse, this too is a weapon. Prayer, verse 18. Pray always with all prayer and supplication. This sword is a weapon. Prayer is a weapon. We're called to pray in the Spirit. This is connected to Ephesians 5.18. We're to be filled with the Spirit. Now, we pray in the Spirit. A prayerful life is a Spirit-filled life. Notice what Paul said here. Pray, uh, verse 18, pray always. He said that earlier in 1 Thessalonians. Pray without ceasing. Pray on all occasions. Pray, praying always. Listen to the Spirit. Let Him prompt you. Let His authentic characteristics empower you. When relationships are, have betrayed you, when you have gone through situations that you struggle with, sometimes we're tempted to look for something else to help our pain. Don't do that. His word is truth. There is no compassion without Christ, and there is no holiness without the cross. We cannot create ourselves for ourselves the very thing that Christ has given to us, and we cannot live in the manner without the Spirit's help. Living in an attitude of prayer means we are a people who constantly understand our need for Him. The enemy cannot stand a people who are in prayer and live in an attitude of prayer. The counterfeits of the devil, the lies of the enemy, are easily exposed by a person who prays and the church who seeks the will of God. The armor of God is a people who prays because our standing firm means we are kneeling. And a kneeling church is one that cannot be moved. Let us cling to Christ. Father God, I praise you for all the provisions you've given us so that we can stand firm. I am a weak man, Lord, easily defeated by the enemy and his lies. And I cling to you. I hold on to you. I love you and I need you. And I cry out to you because I know you are able and capable.